the first speaker is Daniel Yarosh, protein folding, environmental stress, and the evolving relationship between genotype and phenotype. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, so I want to thank the organizers uh, for the opportunity to come to this really very special place and tell you about the work that I've done as a postdoc in Susan Lindquist's lab. Um, you know, one of the biggest questions in biology and in evolution that we've heard about about this, uh, this meeting already uh, involves the rate at which organisms acquire new forms and functions, right? So we're all aware of very slow examples like this ginkgo tree, which looks similar today to its ancestors from 50 or even 100 million years ago that have been preserved in the fossil record. But at the same time, there are examples of much more rapid change. Uh, so these are two alpine columbines from the Sierra Nevada mountains in California. In the last 100,000 years, they've undergone an enormous change in their floral morphology in response to a new pollinator. Uh, these are two stickleback fish from an isolated lake in the Pacific Northwest in the United States. Uh, and in just 20 years, those fish have become larger, they have more plating, and I think you can see right here that they've actually acquired a new appendage as well. Excellent. Uh, and so, of course, also we're, we're aware clinically of uh, cases in which there can be extremely rapid evolution, often with devastating consequences for human health. Um, and these empirical observations really beg the question of whether there are dedicated mechanisms that either uh, maintain stasis or facilitate change. And prevailing theory uh, really suggests no, right? And that's um, in large part because it's been heavily influenced uh, by Charles Darwin's contention that the acquisition of new forms and functions would occur at a relatively slow and constant pace. Um, but in some sense, it seems almost inconceivable that innovations that would require multiple uh, mutations could ever be achieved in the absence of some alternative mechanism. Um, and the place to be in thinking about this is really to recognize a fundamental reality, and that's that selection acts on phenotypes rather than genotypes, and the relationship between genotype and phenotype is much less linear than we might like to believe. And I'm just going to highlight two examples, um, the first of which involves flu virus evolution. So this is a great system because we have archived uh, samples from uh, the CDC, for example, every year, and we know how they're related to one another genetically and how they're related to one another antigenically. And what you can see um, from this study and several others that have come to effectively the same conclusion is that that relationship isn't constant over time. There are periods in which you get a large antigenic burst that isn't accompanied by a concomitant increase in genetic distance and vice versa. And the other example involves maybe the most heritable of human traits, height. Right? So on the left is how well you do at predicting uh, the height of an individual based on uh, the 54 loci that we know from genome-wide association studies are involved in that trait if you make a composite model. So you can explain about 3 to 5 percent of variation in human height. On the right is how well you do uh, by looking at the mid-height of the two parents of the individual. Right? So clearly there's a lot uh, that we have yet to understand. Uh, and that's really a pity, right? Because from a quantitative perspective, we'd like to be able to predict from first principles how uh, an organism's unplex, or rather a, a complex biological system um, will behave, right? But to do that, we need to understand how the underlying regulatory circuitry can change in response to the environment and how those changes might influence the acquisition of new heritable traits. Uh, so during my graduate work, uh, I uh, investigated the fundamental mechanisms through which mutations are made in cells. Um, and as a postdoc, I've been interested in how those, uh, that raw material for evolution is translated into traits on which natural selection can act. Um, and I focused on protein folding uh, in large part because proteins drive uh, the phenotypes on which selection um, can, can act. And um, of course, we all know from Amphison's seminal work right, that it's a protein's primary sequence that fundamentally determines the conformation that it's going to adopt. Um, and that conformation is critical for its function in the cell. And we now have many examples right, of these intricate structures. They can be very diverse. Um, but there's a critical difficulty in folding that isn't appreciated in the Eppendorf tube. 
And that's that it needs to occur in the cell, um, which is a really crowded environment. So I don't know if you've ever made a protein solution at the concentration that proteins are found in the cell, about 300 milligrams per mil, um, but it's like an egg white. It's a very viscous solution. Macromolecular crowding can derail even very robust pathways. And moreover, right, these um, molecules are really colliding with each other all the time as they're folding. Um, and the, the problem is really compounded by the fact that many proteins, and especially key regulatory proteins, are inherently unstable. So for kinases, this is going to be important because they need to adopt multiple conformations in order to exert their function. Um, but group from, or work from many groups has ind indicated that this also can be a constraint on their evolution. Um, and that's because most mutations are destabilizing, and these proteins are really only a mutation or two away um, from instability and degradation, really, and, and becoming non-functional. So the cell copes with the situation um, by uh, in inducing a cohort of proteins. Um, so these are called heat shock proteins. Um, they're mostly molecular chaperones, remodeling factors. The cell also induces some osmolites. Um, and these proteins act individually and combinatorially uh, to help unfolded proteins, which we call clients, the substrates of these chaperone proteins, achieve their normal fold. Um, and the consequence for cellular survival is absolutely enormous. So these are two plates of yeast. Um, they're treated identically. The only difference is that the plate on the left um, had a mild, uh, a mild treatment at 37 degrees, so a little bit of an increased temperature. Then both plates were heat shocked. Um, and so what that mild pretreatment did was to induce all of those proteins in these cells, but not these. And you get about a thousand fold difference in survival. It's huge. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to focus on uh, two of these chaperones today, HSP-104 and HSP-90. Um, and, you know, most of my work um, initially has been on HSP90. Um, so it's a special chaperone among these proteins. It helps uh, proteins to fold. It's very abundant. So it, it constitutes about 1% to 2% of all protein in the cell. In cancer cells, it can be even higher. Uh, its clients, or the substrates on which it acts, are typically key regulatory proteins, so principally kinases, but also some transcription factors. It's essential, um, but its activity can be reduced dramatically, about 20-fold in yeast, without affecting normal survival. So there's sort of a vast excess of HSV90 activity that's available under normal conditions. Um, but that being said, really common environmental stresses, such as an increase in temperature, are sufficient to deplete that excess reservoir of HSV90 activity. Um, and that relationship between environmental stress and uh, HSV90 function can affect the ways in which uh, mutations are manifest uh, as phenotypes. Um, so several lines of evidence lead to this conclusion, um, and I'm just going to highlight two examples, um, the first of which involves the maturation of mutated oncogenes. Um, so this is a protein VSARC. It's a promiscuously activated tyrosine kinases, the kinase. The same mutations that promiscuously activate the protein also render it rather unstable. And so if you look um, at the levels of VSARC in cells, um, you see by immunoblast that they're relatively similar in normal cells and also those that are depleted of HSP90. But instead, if you look at its tyrosine kinase function, you see that that's incredibly dependent on HSP90. Um, so that is to say that the maturation of VSARC into its active form requires chaperone activity. In contrast, uh, an unmutated uh, related progenitor kinase, CSARC, is not really dependent on HSP90 um, for its activation. So this suggests um, that the, the uh, the promiscuously activating mutations in VSARC require HSP90 to exert their function. Um, and this is correlated with a difference in stability between the two proteins of about 8 degrees in melting temperatures. And this is borne out also in the transforming ability of the kinase. So if you add an HSP90 inhibitor to a colony-forming assay, um, you can see that VSARC is no longer able to transform cell. And this has been a paradigm, actually, for other mutated oncoproteins. Um, and as a result, HSP90 inhibitors are in numerous clinical trials as cancer um, therapeutics. But more broadly from these examples, we can see that HSP90 has the ability to basically directly enable the phenotypic consequences of mutations in substrate proteins. So um, work in several multicellular organisms also suggests that HSP90 can suppress the consequences of some mutations. So in flies and plants, zebrafish, also in worms, if you reduce the activity of HSP90 by only about twofold, most individuals are normal. But about 1% show morphological abnormalities. And what abnormality they show depends on their underlying genotype, so what strain you use. 
For example, in one strain of fly, you might get a deformed eye phenotype, in another, a wing phenotype, but never both in the same strain. Um, and this has led to the hypothesis that HSP90 might also act as a phenotypic capacitor, basically storing variation in a cryptic form and then releasing it combinatorially when that excess reservoir of HSP90 activity is depleted by environmental stress. And so you know, it's really kind of an intriguing hypothesis that there may be sort of two ways in which HSP90 can act. On the one hand, to enable the, the phenotypic outcome of some variation, but to suppress the, uh, the outcome of others. Um, but in many ways, these early studies really sparked more uh, questions uh, than they answered. You might ask, for example, you know, how adaptive are any of these, these mechanisms? Um, what's the basis on the, of the underlying variation, right? HSV90 uh, can also affect the um, release of transposons as well as epigenetic variation. Uh, and finally, you know, there's really no evidence uh, in, in these studies that HSV90 might have affected evolutionary trajectories in any kind of meaningful way. Um, so I turn to yeast um, because it offers many genetic advantages. Um, you know, it's a simple unicellular eukaryote. Um, but really, most importantly, as I was uh, coming into the lab, many samples uh, from the wild became available. So there are hundreds of uh, sequenced yeast strains from around the world. They diverge uh, by about up to 1% uh, in their open reading frame sequences. And uh, many of them have been sequenced. Uh, and so I used this model um, to look for what variation HSV90 affected, basically what um, genes uh, were potentiated or buffered by HSV90. Um, and through a lot of work that I am not going to describe, I was able basically to define um, several uh, cases where uh, HSV90 was acting. So basically what I found was that uh, through a variety of uh, mapping studies was that HSV90 could enable the phenotypic consequences of mutations in its substrate proteins. It could also uh, work on proteins that it did not help to fold, um, but they interacted, for example, with proteins um, that were clients of HSV90 activity. And in fact, in uh, several cases, I could even see examples of mutations that occurred in non-coding regulatory sequences that were affected by HSV90. Here, uh, you could get large uh, genotype-specific changes uh, in expression of these genes, probably uh, as a result of HSP90 chaperoning regulators of those sequences. Um, and so just to sort of summarize uh, the, this uh, particular part of the talk, um, you know, the idea basically is that HSV90 appears to be remodeling phenotypic neighborhoods. So you're probably aware of um, these types of charts where uh, each of the nodes represents a genotype, the color, the phenotype that's associated with it, and then these lines are paths that can be taken between the states. And what HSV90 seems to be doing is basically reworking this neighborhood and rendering some paths inaccessible, enabling others, changing the phenotypes uh, of, of other states, and it's simply diversifying um, the population on which natural selection can act. Um, and so in total, um, you know, we mapped about 500 of these associations between genotype and phenotype, quantitative trait loci. About 20% of them could be affected in some way by HSP90 activity uh, in yeast. And uh, moreover, uh, it appears that common environmental stresses, so for example, a simple temperature shift or even uh, a saline stress, were sufficient to actually uh, have very similar effects to very precise HSV90 inhibition. Um, and finally, we were able to see uh, evidence for the action of HSV90 on uh, the evolution of these genomes. So if I looked at the correlation between uh, similarity in genotype and similarity in phenotype across uh, the sequenced wild yeast strains, you could see that that was improved by reducing HSV90 activity. That is to say that it seems that some uh, degree of the standing genetic variation that's present in these genomes that we would have interpreted as being uh, simply drift or silent might actually have phenotypic consequence in the context of reduced HSV90. HSV90 uh, function. And I think Tal's going to talk quite a little bit about uh, this idea in the next talk. So now I'm going to uh, shift gears and tell you a story about a more extreme type of uh, protein folding uh, and how it can affect, uh, it can affect phenotypes, uh, and those are prions. So this sheep um, is sick, and it's sick with a disease called scrapie. And that's caused uh, not by a genetic change, but by a self-perpetuating confirmation of the prion protein PRP. You're probably aware of this um, through the scare over mad cow disease. Um, but it's a fascinating and paradigm-shifting mode of inheritance, right? Um, and yeast actually offers a really fantastic model to investigate this, um, because the same phenomenon exists here. So on these two plates of yeast, uh, the cells are genetically identical, but obviously there's something very different, and that is that in these cells, uh, a translation termination protein called SUP35 exists in a self-perpetuating prion form. 
So if you GFP tag um, the C-terminus of this protein, what you see is that in the red cells, uh, the protein is soluble and distributed throughout the cell. In the white cells, it forms these aggregates. And they're not simply nonspecific clumps of protein. They're actually highly ordered fibers um, that we call amyloid. And um, you know, not only do these look you know, very interesting like cables by electron microscopy, they have a fascinating biochemical property um, that forms the basis of this mode of inheritance. So if you look and monitor assembly of fibers fluorescently um, over time and look at the kinetics, you see a long lag phase and then a burst, right? Um, but if you take some of this material at the end of this first assembly and use it to seed another round of assembly in vitro, you see a very different behavior. So now a huge burst, a very cooperative behavior, a self-templating behavior, in fact. And this forms the basis of that heritability. So in the case of SEP35, that turns out to be controlled um, by the domain structure of the protein. So at the end terminus, uh, there is a domain that controls the prion behavior. The translation termination activity actually resides exclusively in the C terminus of the molecule. I mean, you can actually delete this end terminus and uh, have normal translation termination activity. Um, and so, it, it, and just again, right, this is the, the biophysical basis of the, the prion hypothesis. Um, but in the cell, uh, this uh, sort of uh, collaborates with the disaggregase activity of HSP-104, one of those heat shock proteins I talked about. So what HSP-104 does is choose on the ends of those fibers here to generate seeds for new rounds of replication uh, in daughter cells. And that leads to some very interesting inheritance. So mitotically, as cells divide, these prion conformers are uh, inherited, but also they're stable meiotically. So if you cross a strain that has the protein in its soluble form, a naive strain, to a strain that has uh, the protein in its prion form, you see dominance in the diploid, so all of the uh, soluble protein is uh, converted into the prion form. And uh, if you look at meiotic uh, replication, you see actually that all of the progeny acquired the phenotype. So you get a non-Mendelian segregation uh, that's based on protein-only inheritance. And I should say that you can actually even transform cells with protein that you've created in vivo um, and induced into the prion conformation. So this really is protein-only inheritance. So in the case of SEP35, um, what's ordinarily happening, right, is faithful termination by the ribosome as it's trans uh, translating RNA at stop codons, and that's mediated by this protein. But in uh, the uh, prion form, uh, the SEP35 is sequestered into these fibrils, and that allows some read-through to occur, and this is uh, the red-white color is simply mediated by a, a reporter of read-through. And so this seems kind of crazy, right? Cells go to you know, some trouble to keep their translational fidelity rather high, and you can get rid of this domain uh, and still have normal translational fidelity, um, normal translation termination, and yet uh, that prion-forming ability has been conserved for hundreds of millions of years. And in fact, in the yeast genome and the genomes of other fungi um, and even other organisms as well, there are domains that have the ability, when hooked to GFP, uh, to confer this prion-forming uh, potential. So you know, why are they there? Uh, and one hypothesis uh, is that it's just an accident um, or that they're actually an element of disease. Um, but another possibility is that they exist to create new phenotypes. So in, in laboratory strains, if you make them artificially psi plus um, so that they acquire the prion phenotype, you get read through of some of these stop codons and you can get new traits appearing. Some of them are positive, some are negative. Sometimes the strains grow better in antibiotics, sometimes they don't. Um, sometimes they grow better in natural stresses like salt or pH. Um, but What's interesting is that the, those traits, which ones you see, again, depend on which strain you use, suggesting that there's some relationship to underlying genetic variation in the strain. And so the, this model basically would suggest that you, uh, Psi would allow you to sample variation genome-wide in a combinatorial way and perhaps arrive at genetically complex traits rather rapidly. And again, there are a number of these uh, domains that exist in fungal genomes. What are they really doing? So the model is really a bet hedging one, and that is that if you exist in a large population size, uh, you will, at, at a low frequency, acquire a prion uh, positive cell. So let's say one in 50,000 um, in an average uh, population. Ordinarily, it might express traits that aren't really very beneficial, and it can be purged. Um, but if the environment switches such that the traits that it expresses are advantageous, it can be enriched and could allow the genotype to persist in conditions where it would otherwise perish, there's a complementary back-switching frequency um, that could also provide a survival advantage uh, if the environment changes again. 
Uh, and I should say, as, as I mentioned before, that the competing model is that this is just a disease. Um, but you know, often we look at these, I think, from the, these issues from really the wrong standpoint. Um, in, in the lab, we're really at a fitness apex, right? But in the real world, um, it can be a much more stressful situation, and you can maybe uh, have a lot of space uh, to climb up a, a fitness peak. Um, but that being said, really, you know, a, a damning uh, piece of evidence against this idea has been that prions have never been found in wild strains. Um, and so we thought that this resource of uh, many, many sequenced wild isolates would be a great place to start to look. Um, and so we took them. Um, they come from infected human patients, uh, from oak bark, from soil, from fruit, all over the world, um, and capitalized on the fact that that prion amyloid has a very peculiar biochemical property. Um, and that is that it remains uh, insoluble uh, in detergent. So you can actually separate it from normal soluble protein on agarose gels uh, and see it kind of as a schmutz above um, the soluble protein on a, an amino blot. Um, and so in surveying uh, 700 wild strains, uh, we found several that contained prion amyloids of uh, sub-35, uh, which form psi, as well as two other proteins, RINC uh, and MOC3, um, both of which uh, can form prions. Um, and so, you know, this was very exciting, but we wondered whether this was just nonspecific aggregation or really prion-mediated aggregation. Um, and so we checked to see whether we could get rid of uh, those uh, aggregates by inhibiting the activity of that disaggregase, HSP-104, which, remember, is responsible for the heritability of the prion form in daughter cells. Uh, and we could see that, again, in these wild strains, we could get rid of the aggregation uh, by curing with an inhibitor of HSP-104 as well as dominant negative variants. Um, and so the question is, why have these? We observe spontaneous loss. Uh, if we'd streak it out and look at 100 different colonies, you'd see one or two of them would lose the, the prion. And when we looked in standard laboratory media, there was no growth advantage of having the prion. In fact, uh, in general, it was disadvantageous. Um, and then it occurred to us that we really needed to look in a more natural situation. Um, and so here is a case uh, with the grape must medium. So this is a, a wine strain, a port wine strain. Um, that grew identically in its natural version and after we cured it of the Psi plus prion um, in normal laboratory media. When we grew it in grape must media, basically we found that the strain was addicted um, to having the prion. It's basically unable to grow in its absence. Um, and we find many, many other examples. Here's a case um, in which uh, a yeast grows adhesively, so uh, often wild strains can actually invade the agar substratum on which you grow them. Um, this turned out to be, uh, and so you can see this after you wash the cells, whether they're still present on the plate, um, this also turned out to be side dependent. Um, we could demonstrate that that was definitely due to prion-mediated aggregation um, by looking at the uh, deletion of this prion domain and restoring normal translation termination. Uh, we have the same effect. And so we wondered really what was happening here, right? Um, yeah, how is Psi really working? Is you, are you really getting read through throughout the genome? What's going on? Um, and so we collaborated with Jonathan Weissman um, at UCSF to use a new technique called ribosome profiling to basically look and see where the ribosome sits in the genome and whether that changes when you have uh, acquisition of the prion state, so if you get read through past stop codons. And so basically what this technique does is to combine the classic ribosome footprinting technique that uh, Joan Stites invented decades ago uh, with high-throughput sequencing. And you can take the ribosome-protected fragments uh, and then uh, subject them to high-throughput sequencing and map them back to the genome and look to see where ribosome density falls through an open reading frame and whether it is stopping at the stop codon or past it. Um, and so what we see, um, and then we can compare this with uh, Psi plus cells, right, uh, and ask whether you see a density past the stop codon. And so um, when we did this in the wild strains uh, and also some laboratory strains that we made Psi artificially, um, what we saw is that actually, although there was a genome-wide signature of read-through that was Psi-mediated, it wasn't uh, happening at most of the open reading frames. So at the average stop codon, there was absolutely normal translation termination. Um, but at some, there was actually almost perfect read-through. Um, and so this is actually very interesting. It suggests that Psi might be acting in a much more surgical fashion than we had initially thought. Um, and there seems to be a very strong um, sequence bias uh, for two motifs found uh, either both 5' prime and 3' prime of the stop codon. And in fact, um, the sort of loop structure in which the stop codon uh, is found is quite novel. These are actually among the most ordered uh, mRNAs in some in vivo protection experiments um, that we've done. 
And so what this uh, suggests, actually, and I should say these um, sites, some of them are conserved through yeast lineages, others of them are more rapidly evolving. Um, but what this suggests is that actually uh, there may be sort of a cohort of genes um, that have been selected to be regulated by Cyplus. Um, and so you know, we wondered whether this was really the whole story, whether uh, you know, it was really just you know, one or two prions, or you know, again, there are all these other prion domains. Were there other um, prions that exist in wild strains, and did they have important phenotypes as well? Um, so unfortunately, there are only antibodies that were sufficient to analyze those three proteins um, in, by those biochemical assays that I showed you. Um, so we took a phenotypic approach. And basically, uh, what we did was to take all of those wild isolates and then um, to transiently inhibit the cystagrase, HSV-104, and what that does is to cure them of those, uh, those aggregates and compare um, these cured derivatives to the wild strains phenotypically. So again, they had relatively similar growth in standard lab media, um, and so what about other conditions? And there, there were lots of changes. Um, so really, uh, all, all across the spectrum. So we looked at uh, you know, some natural stresses as well as um, FDA-approved drugs, et cetera. Um, you know, here's one example. This is a clinical isolate from uh, Mass General Hospital from a, a patient. Um, this is a, an assay for the sort of overall mutagenesis um, going on in the strain. It's a cannabinine reversion assay. Basically, if you see more colonies, uh, it, it indicates that there are more mutants showing up. Here's the isolate itself. Here's the isolate after curing. If you pick these, you can show actually that they're bona fide mutants in the CAN1 gene. Um, and just to give you a quantitative benchmark, um, this is what uh, a laboratory strain looks like after uh, having a mismatch repair knocked out, right? So this is really a, an enormous effect. Um, but at this point, we wondered whether these were, again, bona fide uh, prion phenotypes or something else. Um, and so we looked at another feature that is critical for uh, prion biology, and that's cytoplasmic inheritance. Um, and so uh, we wanted to take uh, traits, or strains that had multiple traits, um, to improve the ability to score transfer. Um, so I looked at the South African wine strain that grew well uh, in YPD, but grew poorly after curing, uh, but grew poorly in PH9 and better after curing, and then also an American clinical isolate that uh, had salt traits, uh, a DNA damage trait, and a maltose trait. And the idea um, basically is to look whether if I just transfer cytoplasm between these donor strains and a naive recipient strain, if I get transfer of the trait as well. Um, and again, because some of the uh, or many prion traits right, depend on underlying genetic variation, I might not expect to see transfer of all of those phenotypes. So basically, the experiment um, is as follows. If you use a, a CAR mutant, um, so this is a, a gene in yeast um, that, when mutated, keeps the nuclei physically separated. And what that means is that you can make a header carry-on where you have a mixture of the cytoplasm, but you don't have transfer of genetic information. Um, and then you can select for buds that retain um, only the nucleus of the uh, acceptor strain, um, but have a mixed cytoplasmic component. We call these cytoductins. Um, and again, you get cytoplasmic transfer, but with no exchange of nuclear material. Um, and so what I saw um, was that several of these traits were transferred from the wild strains to the laboratory recipient in so doing. Um, so for example, the trait in YPD um, from the South African wine strain, it remained curable by transient inhibition of HSP-104 in the lab strain, suggesting this was really a prion-mediated trait that was transferred. Similarly, um, here in the clinical isolate, the DNA damage trait and the maltose trait were transferred. The pH9 trait and the salt trait were not transferred either. Um, they're not due to prions, or it could also be that the genetic variation um, that was required to manifest those traits in the wild strains is not present in the laboratory recipients. Um, so the astute among you will have noticed that something else also transferred in those experiments, and that's the mitochondria from uh, the donor strains. So I did a control just to ensure um, that that wasn't uh, the case, or that the mitochondria was not responsible for the phenotypes, um, and indeed there was no, no transfer. Um, but basically, you know, this is sort of the big picture. Uh, we, in total, we looked at 700 strains. About a third of them have some change in their phenotypic profile that's created by transient inhibition of this disaggregase, right? Um, and, you know, those traits are transferable from those strains to a laboratory recipient. But only a minority of those um, harbor prions that we know are involved in creating new phenotypes. And it suggests that really there are quite a lot more out there, um, potentially of unknown molecular origin. Um, so to summarize, it appears that prions are at least um, feature, I should say inheritance that has the basic features of prion biology. is actually very common in wild strains of yeast. Um, and many uh, of these elements appear to be of unknown molecular origin. 
Um, I didn't have time uh, to talk about this, but the genotype-phenotype relationship uh, is generally made a bit weaker um, by curing the strains of these prions, suggesting that they may collectively uh, function as uh, capacitors. And finally, um, really both of these mechanisms uh, suggest that there are ways in which protein homeostasis can give you the appearance of an environmentally acquired trait, but that's really solidly based uh, in a Darwinian framework of mutation and selection. Um, and with that, I'd like to um, thank the people who made this work possible, principally Susan for uh, really being an amazing mentor, uh, as well as Randall who helped me with much of the work. I wanna highlight two absolutely amazing undergraduates, Sandra Jones, who's now uh, at the Rockefeller, and Amelia Chang, who's now a grad student at Harvard. Um, the yeast community has been incredibly generous with strains, um, and they've had great conversations with Leonid, Ethan, and Aviv, uh, as well as Jonathan. I thank the kind folks who funded the work and you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take questions. Um, we have uh, time for one, one question. We are running a little bit <clears throat> over. This is a very elegant work, but apparently the audience is genetic. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, probably it will come back in general discussion. So thank you very much. And the, the next speaker is Tao Dagan. The cumulative impact of chaperone mediated folding on genome evolution. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, hello, and of course, thank you very much for the invitation to this very interesting meeting in a uh, very extraordinary place. I changed a bit the title of my talk following the discussion yesterday about hybridization, maybe to uh, motivate people working on molecular evolution to use different models than phylogenetic trees. I will, of course, come back to my original topic about the chaperones and genome evolution in the second half of my talk. So the first part of my talk is about trends and barriers to lateral transfer in microbial evolution. In uh, prokaryotes, we have lateral gene transfer. This is something that we don't have in eukaryotes, so we inherit our genome from our parents, but prokaryotes can actually take DNA from the environment or borrow it from their neighbors and incorporate it into their genomes in a process called lateral gene transfer. Today we know that it's a very important mechanism for prokaryote genome evolution, and we also know that only few genes can, cannot be transferred between genomes. The mechanisms, the main mechanisms include transformation. In this mechanism, prokaryotes acquire naked DNA or raw DNA from the environment and incorporate into their chromosome. In conjugation, we have a real mechanism for transfer, so this is not via uh, the cell, Rather, we have a conjugation channel. This is a proteinaceous uh, tunnel, and plasmids, usually plasmids, are being transferred from the donor to the host. The third mechanism involves phages. So phages can attack bacteria, and when they pack their DNA uh, in the phage, they can take by mistake, by chance, pieces of DNA, and when they next attack the uh, next host, they can transfer DNA from the previous host to this uh, bacteria, and if the bacteria survives the attack, they might have some DNA acquired from the previous host of the phage. Taking all of these uh, gene transfers into account, when we look at the phylogenetic tree, using this model, we can model gene inheritance or vertical inheritance from ancestors to descendants. But when we deal with prokaryotes, we know that lateral gene transfer occurs today, we have no uh, real reason to believe it did not occur in the past. And from looking at prokaryotic genomes, we know that it occurs in very high frequencies. So how can we take all of these lateral gene transfers into account and still study something about microbial genome evolution? We can use an alternative to trees, and these are networks. So what are networks? We've seen some already this meeting, but basically these are mathematical models that are used to model pairwise relations between entities. So we have entities here in circles, and we have the relations here in edges, these are those lines. 
the most simple representation of a network could be a geographical network, and then we have several cities, and they are connected by roads. Networks actually started in the beginning of the 70s with the social studies, and then we had social networks that are, of course, making a comeback today, and the entities are people, and the edges here are social relations. But we can have also genomic or phylogenomic networks, and then the entities here are genomes or fully sequenced genomes, and the relations here, the edges, are the relations or phylogenetic, phylogenetic relations between the genomes. And there are already some of these phylogenomic networks in the literature, and they are reconstructed from gene presence absence data, proton sequence similar, similarity, and also phylogenetic trees. The networks can be also directed. When we have a directed network, we have an additional information here on the edges regarding the direction of the relation. If we go back to the social networks, if we have, for example, a network of people that send an email uh, to one each other, then we have a direction to this relation. We have the information who sent the email and who received the email. When we look at genomic networks of lateral gene transfer, we also might have some additional information regarding the transfer events because this is also a directed event. We have a donor and we have a recipient in this lateral gene transfer. If you could reconstruct such directed, event, uh, directed events in lateral gene transfer and reconstruct a network which is directed, a phylogenomic network that is directed, this will allow us to study the nature of this process in much more detail. In order to do that, we developed a pipeline to identify lateral gene transfer events and the direction as well. And we do it by identifying recent gene acquisitions in, genome, in genomes, microbial genomes, by looking at unusual codons. We then infer putative donors using a statistical and phylogenetic approach. And that allows us to reconstruct a phylogenetic tree from which we infer a lateral gene transfer event you, uh, when we have both the donor and the recipient. Using this pipeline on about 600 genomes, we managed to detect about 32,000 recent lateral gene transfers. We then summarize all of those transfers onto one big directed network, and this is how it looks. So this is a very complicated graph, but let's look at the colors. So we have here entities, these are the circles, these entities are microbial genomes, and the color of these circles are the taxonomic groups noted here at the bottom. The circles are connected by edges. These are the lines, directed edges, and these signify one or more lateral gene transfer event. Let's focus on a relatively simple cluster just to see this process in detail. So we have here three genomes, three microbial genomes, and they are connected by edges of lateral gene transfer event. For example, here we detected a lateral gene transfer event of a riboflavin biosynthesis protein from this myxococcus to that chloroflexus. And this edge in here signifies one transfer of elongation factor between these two delta proteobacteria. And you see here the arrow, that means that this one is the donor, and that one down here is the recipient of the transfer event. But we have much more complicated clusters than that. These are, this is a group of Clostridia species and Petrotoga mobilis. We detected here a few transfers of heavy metal ATPases and additional transfers between these Clostridia. All of the species in this cluster are thermophilic, hence this transfer could have occurred in a common habitat. Now, I already told you that the colors here, uh, the meaning of the colors is the taxonomic groups, but there is also a meaning to the distribution of the nodes in this graph. We can see that we have a big uh, component here of many connected microbes, but we have also some clusters of microbes that are disconnected from the general network. So who are they? We have here Coxiella boenti, we have here uh, Le Leptospera interrogans, and also Legionella pneumophila. What is uh, characteristic or typical to all of these species is that all of them are endosymbionts. And we know that when we have endosymbionts, the relation with the host is a barrier to gene transfer from other species. Yet we also know from the studies of uh, Nancy Moran and others that these species can still exchange genes 
with uh, endosymbionts of the same host, because then they cross this host barrier. And this is exactly what we see in these clusters. So they are connected with species that are endosymbionts of the same host. Another group of interest here is cyanobacteria, and here we got clusters that are uh, distinguished uh, by habitat. High light adapted Procholococcus and low light adapted Procholococcus are clustered into different clusters. So that clusters in this network of lateral gene transfer are distinguished not only by genera, but also by habitat. Now, we know that microbial genomes are very, very dynamic. They uh, gain genes, they delete genes, and everything happens very quickly. But the fact that we focus here on recent lateral gene transfer allows us to couple this information with cellular and habitat information or any ecological feature uh, on this network. So in this picture now, the nodes are colored by the taxonomic groups, but we can also focus, for example, on lifestyle. In this picture now, the same nodes are colored with, uh, by red or green, depending on there being pathogens, these are the red, or non-pathogens, these are the green. Using this network structure, we can compare gene transfer trends between pathogens and non-pathogens. We find that uh, we have a lot of transfers here between pathogens, but this is because they are uh, much oversampled in genomic databases. When we normalize to, the, to their overrepresentation, we find that all of them are microbes. They do it more or less in the same frequency. But we do find also interesting transfers between non-pathogens and pathogens. And this cluster probably shows the whole story. We have here a non-pathogenic Burkholderia right in the middle of many pathogenic Burkholderia species. And what we see is that many genes are transferred between these two pathogenic populations via this non-pathogen. So this is a mediator species of uh, gene transfer between pathogenic populations. Could be, for example, have a very uh, high impact on the evolution of antibiotic resistance. Up until now, we looked at the, at the nodes, but we can also look at the edges. So if I now switch to that kind of view, we see the edge weight. The edge weight means how many genes are transferred between the donor and the recipients connected by the edge. So we have gray edges. These are one gene. Going up to warm colors, these are many genes. Now, most of our heavy edges, the ones with the warm colors, connect nodes of the same color. We can see it here in this uh, zoom on a cluster of proteobacteria. We have here beta proteobacteria, alpha proteobacteria, and gamma proteobacteria. In order to look for some structure in this network, we went and looked for community structure in this network. What, what are communities? These are nodes in the network that are much more connected within the nodes than with nodes outside the community. If we think, for example, about social networks, these are groups of people that are much highly connected than people outside the community. If you check, for example, your email list, you will find that there are some people with which you correspond very frequently by email, and some email you send probably one greeting for Christmas. So these are people that are less connected to your community, the people with which you are densely connected by emails. And you can find them in networks by looking for the weak uh, points within the network and break the network into the communities. When we ran this algorithm on this big network, we received uh, about 80 communities. Here I show you only the communities in the biggest component. So in here on the right, we see the biggest component with taxonomic colors. And here on the left, we see this biggest component, but only with the communities now. And genomes or nodes from the same community are colored by the same color. Now, the communities mostly fit what we know about microbial taxonomy. For example, this community is bacilli species. This community is only alpha proteobacteria. But we see also mixed communities, like the red one. This is a mix of proteobacteria, delta proteobacteria, gamma proteobacteria, and beta proteobacteria. These kind of communities are assigned for intergeneric transfers. These are transfers between distantly related donor and recipients, or we call them also distant recent lateral gene transfers. We detected about 1,500 such transfers in this network. Now, most of the transfers here are between closely related species that have very similar genomes, and this makes sense if we know that uh, the integration into the genome 
of the acquired DNA is mostly facilitated by homologous recombination. But when we look at the network and find this portion of the genes that are transferred between distantly related genomes and between very uh, dissimilar genomes, we try to think of other explanations. Now, there are several molecular mechanisms that might explain that. We decided to test one of those, so we focused our attention on the non-homologous end joining mechanism. This is a DNA double strand break repair mechanism in eukaryotes, and it composed in eukaryotes in, uh, by three proteins that are doing the end binding and synapses, terminal processing, and ligation of the broken DNA strands. During these stages here, the terminal processing and ligation, because the, this is a double strand break repair, uh, sometimes this mechanism is gaining some help by uh, random fragments of DNA that are floating in the cell. And in our genomes, it has been shown that uh, sometimes in here, there are pieces of viral DNA and also mitochondrial DNA that are being captured into the chromosome by this DNA repair mechanism. Now, this mechanism was also uh, found in prokaryotes. It was predicted by Aravid and Kunin and was shown later on to be also functional in Bacillus by Weller et al. So it could be maybe that by this mechanism, uh, this mechanism might facilitate gene acquisition or DNA acquisition in prokaryotes. In our network, there are about 200 genomes that encode for these proteins required for the non-homologous end joining. And the hypothesis we would like to test is whether species that have the non-homologous end joining acquire genes more frequently from distantly related donors in comparison to species that do not have that mechanism, because this mechanism does not need any sequence similarity between the acquired DNA and the host genome. We went to the network and asked our question, and what we found is this. We have here the distribution of the proportion of recipients and their mean uh, donor genome sequence similarity. What we see is that the red curve, these are the genomes that encode the non-homologous end joining. They are significantly biased towards dissimilar donors in comparison to species that do not encode that mechanism. If you look at proton similarity, another sort of measure again, species that encode non-homologous end joining are significantly biased towards donors to, that are not similar to their genome. So we have here a significant result showing that species ha that have the non-homologous end joining acquire genes from dissimilar donors in comparison to species that lack that mechanism. Hence, our results suggest that this non-homologous end joining, a DNA repair mechanism, has a role in gene acquisition within prokaryotes by supplying a bypass to the donor-recipient genome similarity barrier. With that, I would like to move to the second part of my talk. I will use the same principles that I already explained, and now I'm going to talk about the cumulative impact of chaperone-mediated folding on genome evolution. So we know what are chaperones, we know what is genome evolution, and we we'll try to convince you that they are somehow related. So this is a completely different chapter in the uh, molecular cell biology. We are moving to protein translation. So protein translation, we have the ribosomes and nascent polypeptides start to emerge. Some proteins can fold spontaneously, gain their function, and go and perform their function in the cell. But some proteins require the help of the chaperones. These are specific uh, proteins that help the proteins to fold. In this example, we see the barrel-like 3C or CCT chaperones that are found in archaea and eukaryotes, helped by the prefolding. So now the chaperone is being folded within this barrel and gains in function and goes to perform the function. What happens if a, a protein needs the chaperones but they are not there, something goes wrong, we have misfolded proteins, they form aggregates, very similar to uh, prions, for example, amyloid structures, and this is very harmful to the cell, maybe even lethal. Chaperones were found to uh, have an immense effect on the phenotypes of organisms. So we already saw in the uh, last talk that HSP-90 uh, depletion in Arabidopsis can reveal phenotypes that are typical to heat stress conditions. And in prokaryotes, uh, uh, there is evidence that overexpression of the groyal, groyal chaperonins in E. coli can mask the effects of high mutational loads. So if, if we take these two findings into account, 
uh, we find that chaperones are capacitors of phenotypic variation and they can buffer against deleterious mutations. Why is that? Maybe because when the proteins acquire some deleterious mutations, when they interact with the chaperones and they are being folded by someone else, they are less dependent upon the sequence of the amino acids for their spontaneous folding. So this actually raises the idea that maybe they will have, the chaperones may have some impact on the uh, evolution of proteins. And this was indeed tested in vitro by the group of Dan Tofik from Weizmann. They showed that groyel grace overexpression in the tube doubles the number of accumulating mutation and promotes directed enzyme evolution in vitro. Taking that into account, we thought maybe it will have impact on genome evolution over time. To test that, we used a, a, a subset of uh, E. coli proteins that were tested by Kerner et al. to have interaction with the Goyel chaperonin. What they did, they tagged the Goyel Goyes, and they fished for 250 proteins that have interaction with the chaperone in E. coli. They then classified the, this group of proteins based on their dependency upon the Goyel for folding into three different classes. They have independent substrates that can fold also spontaneously. They have partially dependent substrates that can fold spontaneously only at 25 degrees, but require the Groyel at uh, 37 degrees. And they found also a set of obligatory substrates, these are proteins that cannot fold and gain functionality without the assistance of Groyel. If we take the former slide into uh, account and this data set, and we think that maybe, okay, chaperones might have some impact on protein evolution over time, then we would expect to see increased evolutionary rate when we compare the evolutionary rate of obligatory substrates to independent substrates. This is because the chaperones interaction with the Goyel allows them to acquire some more mutations because they are being folded anyway by the chaperone. They can do some more, they can have some more mistakes. We tested this uh, hypothesis by comparative genomics. We took these uh, 250 substrates in the three classes and we compared their evolutionary rates. What we see in these graphs is the result in, three, in four different uh, phylogenetic depth or resolutions. Each point in this graph is the mean substitution rate for a specific class of proteins. The greens are the obligatory substrates, so this is the class. And the y-axis uh, shows what is the mean genomic substitution rate for the genome. Because we compare all of them to E. coli, we do not assume that all of the genomes evolve in exactly the same rate, so that the y, the, the x-axis, sorry, shows us the variation across genomes, and the y-axis shows us the variation across the different classes. What we see in the results is that the different classes, proteins in the different classes, evolve significantly in different rates. And we also see that obligatory proteins, these are the green, evolve much faster than the blue ones. These are the independent proteins. But we see in addition, if we quantify the difference between these two groups, we found that obligatory substrates evolved on average 35% faster than spontaneous or independent substrates. So that's a huge impact of Groyel on protein evolution. So the conclusion, groyel groyes assisted folding increases the evolutionary rate of proteins by buffering for the deleterious effects of misfolding-related mutations. Our next question was inspired by Jacques Mono, who said what is uh, true for an E. coli is true also for an elephant. But of course, we had to use a very different model organism. So we are going to test the same hypothesis or the impact of chaperone-mediated folding in eukaryotes. What we used in here was an exceptional data set produced by uh, the group of Walid Huri, by Gong et al. What they did, they tagged chaperones in yeast, and this time we have data not only for Goyel, but for the many different chaperone families in eukaryotes. You can see them here. And they tagged these chaperones, 63 in total, and pulled down all of their interaction partners. They constructed a huge database of about uh, 18,000 interactions of about 60% of the yeast proton. What they found in their analysis is that some chaperones are highly promiscuous and interact with most proteins in the genome. 
And they also found that the protein can interact with up to 25 chaperones uh, during uh, its lifetime. And our question again, do we see any evolution with uh, any correlation with evolutionary rates? Now, this is a much bigger data set than what we have in E. coli, and the variety of chaperones here is overwhelming in comparison to the prokaryotic system or folding pathway. We tried the usual statistics approach uh, for a few months before we gave up, but we are doing networks uh, in our lab. I showed it already in the first part of my talk, so we decided to use the same approach in here as well. And when we look at this data, this is actually, we can uh, collect it and assemble a protein-protein interaction network. And in this case, the nodes, the entities are proteins and the edges are interactions, or proteins that were found to interact in the cell. But our network is multipartite because we have two different types of entities. We have chaperones in green and we have substrates in blue or chaperone interactors. And we are interested only in these connections, interactions between a chaperone and a substrate. But we might see some interactions also between chaperones because they might fold in unison a certain substrate or they might fold each other. This is also possible. We are not interested at all in interaction between different substrates. So we took the data from Gong et al. and we uh, constructed a matrix out of it. This is a network in a matrix representation. The chaperones are here in the x-axis, and the subsets are here in the y-axis. And if uh, we have, these are the, the edges are the cells in this matrix. If the cell is gray, it means that this chaperone and that substrate were found to interact. Otherwise, it is black. We can all already see here these chaperones that are really promiscuous and interact with almost all of the proton yeast. And we can also see here these substrates that interact with many chaperones. Now, we took this network and we did the same trick we did on the lateral gene transfer network. We looked for communities. But communities in this uh, sense, in this network, are chaperone and substrates that interact very frequently, much more than any chaperones and substrates outside of their community. When we used the same algorithm on this network, we found 10 different communities. So there is very uh, clear structure in this network. 10 different communities of substrates and their dedicated chaperones. Now the matrix is sorted. So here, these are the communities now by color. And we can see here that the, the edges or interactions within the communities are now uh, colored by the same color. And we also see that the algorithm did not classify these promiscuous chaperones that turn out to be HSP70s into any of the communities. They are kind of general purpose. The next thing we wanted to do is to test if there is some, any uh, correlation with evolutionary rate. And to do that, we used positional orthologs. Uh, this is from the group of Aviv Regev. We compared those using cluster W and calculated evolutionary rates using phylogenetic trees. What we found is that the evolutionary rate of substrates in the 10 different communities is significantly different between the 10 communities. But not only that, what we see here is a similar graph to what I showed for the prokaryotic data. So we have here the median, median substitution rate in the genome in comparison to yeast and median substitution rate in the, in the community. Each of these dots, so each of these lines is one genome in comparison to yeast. These are 20 fungal genomes. So each of these dots is the median substitution rate for the community, meaning a, different, a, a specific set of substrate that uses a specific set of chaperones in a certain fungal genomes. And what we've we seen here is that the, the red communities in all of the genomes are at the bottom. They evolve relatively slow. And the blue communities, they are always at the top. They evolve relatively fast. The fact that they, are, they appear more or less in the same order in all of the genomes means that the order or the rate of evolution of these substrates is conserved during fungal evolution. Moreover, this, uh, these communities capture the known correlations between expression and evolutionary rate. These communities that were found, the red or warm color communities that were found to evolve very slowly, they are also highly expressed, while those communities that found, were found to evolve relatively fast, they are lowly expressed. 
The impact of the chaperones in here is also quite uh, large. So on average, the substrates in the fast communities evolve on average 25% faster than substrates in the slow communities. In addition, we found that substrates in the different communities differ significantly in amino acid usage, amino acid properties, and also secondary structure. Overall, our conclusions here is that proton-wide categories of chaperone substrate specificity uncover novel hubs of functional constraint in protein evolution that are conserved across these 20 fungal genomes that we compared. If you think of it, it makes sense because chaperones are a kind of a service that is given to proteins in the cell. Now, there are many, many proteins that need the same service, so they have to be recognized by the same chaperone. So this is a hub protein, it interacts with many proteins. But all of these proteins, the subset of the same chaperone, should have something in similar in common so that the chaperone will recognize them as substrates. And this is exactly what we see in the physiochemical properties of these proteins. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and to my collaborators on these two projects and, of course, the funding agencies. Money makes the world go round. So, thank you. And questions? In one of the last plots, and also in the previous ones, you plot uh, the average uh, genomic rate of evolution against the, the rate in each one of the groups, okay? But uh, what do you mean with average genomic rate of evolution? Is rate or distance? You, you understand my question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's rate. It is calculated from, uh, so, uh, from branches. So time was taken into account. It's, it's not just... Distance between it's, different genomes. No, no, it's not distance, it's rate. It's calculated from branches of phylogenetic trees. So uh, phylogenetic independence was taken into account? Yeah. Okay, thank you. You mean the relation between the species? Uh, well, because if... There is, no, there no, is. if it's okay. great, it's, it's okay. No. Okay, okay. Uh, any more questions? Lynn? Do you see functional differences in your 10 categories? Because you could imagine if there's a different kind of stress, you might want to induce a certain kind of uh, a chaperone to, to en enable more variation in that kind. I wouldn't either of that kind of approach. No, we, we, found, we found no differences in functional categories, chromosome allocation, uh, specific uh, motifs in amino acids, specific motifs in messenger RNAs, and that's all. About the first part of the talk, uh, I know, it, it, do you do you see any uh, what I might call missing communities that because there are a lot of uncultural organ unculturable organisms? Obviously, that's less of a problem now with micro, you know, with uh, the microbiome kind of work. But still, you might be able to see them. No, this is uh, this is missing data. We we used only completely sequenced genomes. Uh, we know today that it is uh, less than one percent of the species that are around, probably much less than that also. So yeah, we are in genomic analysis. We are always biased towards whatever we sequenced. But what I'm curious is whether you s can see that you may be missing g data in certain places. Uh, black holes. Uh, I cannot cannot say. I mean, black holes are exactly the things you don't know. I really don't know. Uh, we need to move on, and in half an hour there is a general session, so so we can ask the questions. I'm sorry. So the next speaker is uh, Rajanish Giri. Nearly identical, yet very different folding mechanism. Beyond for artificial I mean, and beyond for artificially evolved proteins. Yeah, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for organizing the meeting, a prestigious meeting in EMBU. So, what I will talk is I will talk about two proteins and their different variants, which are going to increase in sequence identity and they are, in spite of having very high sequence identity, 
their fold function and folding mechanism everything is different so first of all i would like to show you my subject area means on which uh, subject which we have studied here basically we have studied the g and gb uh, domain proteins they are two small domain proteins of 56 amino acid each and uh, they have very different function of uh, ga binds hsa while gb binds the igg domain so and they have a different fold also this is alpha helical and this is alpha beta so initially there was no sequence identity you can say just 16% and 16% is nothing while by protein engineering approaches from both the sides from ga they mutated three residues and from gb they mutated few residues again and there is to 30% sequence identity and then again by starting from this ga gb 30 from both the sides again they moved to the new platform which was 77% sequence identity and it has been checked by nmr and cd and all the biophysical tools that their structure function are different means are intact you can say means as boil type then again they moved from 77 and they started from 77 they reached to 88% percent. and still they found that their fold and function was different was intact and further again they moved to 95% percent sequence identity starting from 98 they mutated few residues you can see here in in this 88 there are six residues difference in 95 there are three residues difference so they mutated few residues here also these are different so they make it same so again the sequence identity got to 95% and there was still one more combination which was 98 which i am not showing here because uh, we i was not able to uh, finalize the experiments although i performed the experiments on ga 98 but i uh, with gb 98 there was some stability problem so i was i am not showing here but in g and gb 98 there is only one amino acid difference and the fold function and folding mechanism all are different so that was a fantastic subject to study means what will happen in the folding mechanism because the final fold is different uh, function is different and uh, what the seminal experiment of uh, anfinson has discovered in 50 years ago that the amino acid sequence is going to decide the fold so what is in between because the this is determined and this is final so the folding mechanism is the real issue which should be discovered here so that was the fantastic target to achieve here so to to do it we just followed the biophysical methods and there is a standard biophysical method although i will not go very detail here because i have only 10 minutes allotted here so we followed the stop flow kinetics and when we stop flow kinetics we perform and we get the traces here like here and we get the some rate constant that is the k value so with the rate constants we plot the uh, we plot the rate constants versus this denaturant concentration and the plot is called seven plot because it comes in the shape of a uh, goat horn sevre means goat horn so it, it has been it has came from the french word so this seven plot is the criteria which is which decides the folding mechanism and we found that all our ga proteins ga30 ga77 ga88 these all were following a two state scenario like that although recently we found one more domain here which was a two state folder and it was very difficult domain to uh, discover the folding mechanism here so i will not go here but i will be focusing on the gagb story and the gb proteins i am showing the bio, in this uh, wild type gb protein and here in wild type gb protein you can found that there is a roll over there is a curvature it's not straight like earlier you found that there is it is straight there is a straight line and here also it is straight line 
and if both the lines are straight it is a two straight folder while well, if any of the line is going to have a curvature then it's a three straight folder so we found that gv proteins are a three straight folder and gv was two straight folder and just to show that here that this is a two straight folder all the said 377 and 88 gv proteins and in 88 they all are the three straight folder with a beautiful curvature you can see and in our biophysical experiment if you find the seven plots like that this is called the fantabulous seven plot we just feel ecstatic after getting such a seven plot that it's, it's so clean and so now up to this time you can say that okay these GA proteins GA30 means 30% sequence identity 77% sequence identity protein and 88% sequence identity with its counterpart GB. So these all are the two state folders here while these GB proteins are the three state folders. So now the final the, the question came that okay these are the finally they are the two state folders GA and GB is a three state folder but what will happen at the am amino acid level on most of the amino acid. So to go in more detail you can say to go inside the heart of the protein with each and every amino acid. Only two minutes left. We have ten minutes left. Okay, give me a subsidy of two minutes more. So, uh, <coughs> so to deal it there is a technique called five value analysis and this five value analysis we work with, uh, <coughs> with the mutagenesis and we mutate it and then we take the kinetics experiments and after the kinetics experiment we calculate the phi value here and with this phi value we know that okay this residue we, we know the importance of this residue and suppose its phi value is near to zero then it is not so important in the folding mechanism and if it is one then it is very important in the folding mechanism these are the leaders of the in the protein because the um, proteins are made up of amino acids and in lot of amino acids, the high phi value amino acid will say that these are the important amino acids where the other amino acids are going to fold. Like here in the meeting, here in the meeting you, you can say that it was organized by Professor Bernardi, Professor Herber and uh, other sponsored groups. So they are the folding nucleus. They are the high phi value, value amino acids and we all have folded here. So this was the folding nucleus. So to see the folding nucleus we mutated all the amino acids and we performed the experiments. These are the years of data and in GB proteins also we performed many mutants here and after the mutagenesis we found we plotted the transition state of the GA proteins and we found that the high phi value amino acids are in the center of the GA proteins. So there was only one folding nucleus means only one uh, means leadership center of few amino acids which are going to decide and which are going to uh, ask the other amino acids that come and fold us. And in GB proteins, in GB proteins we found that there are two folding nucleus, especially in GB30 there is one folding nucleus at the first beta happening, while in GB77 the folding nucleus is diffused here, while in GB88 the folding nucleus in the second beta happening. So we found here that GB proteins are three shared folders which are already approved but here with two folding nucleus which get stabilized by changing the sequence because in 30 and 77 there is a big change in the sequence. Although a few days, just four days ago it got accepted and uh, I felt ecstatic. So finally conclusion is there that mechanism of folding of proteins is highly dependent on their native structure. And GA proteins follow two straight folder folding mechanism irrespective of a big change in sequence. While the GB proteins are a three straight folder and uh, with two folding nucleus irrespective of a big change in sequence again. And now let's go to the evolutionary perspective. Although this is the last slide here. Uh, finally, we can conclude that G and GB protein for uh, variants are very robust to change in sequence in retain their fold function and folding mechanism. So uh, up to this part we just uh, published this part but this was a new idea which uh, before coming to this evolutionary meeting and we found that okay this has a evolutionary perspective also.
because these are the in vitro generated amino acids, although not natural domains, because uh, we change a lot of amino acids here. So, what is the evolutionary perspective in terms of heteromorphic pairs? So, uh, and just to say that, okay, if this is possible in nature or not, so just to see the possibility in the nature, uh, we just uh, extrapolated that, okay, what, what can be possible here? So, you know that the m proteins are the permutation combination of 20 conventional amino acids. And if you take just only 100 amino acid peptide, then there are 10 to the power 20 different combinations, which is uh, million, trillion, and further I don't know. But so 10 to power 20 different combinations. And in this such a huge combination, if, you, if it is a neutral evolution, what yesterday we were talking about the neutrality and selective versus. So if the evolution is neutral, then there are 10 to 20 different combinations possible. And in such a scenario, it will not be difficult to find a natural domain up to 98% sequence identity and uh, different structure, different function and all the things. So, yeah, finally I would like to thank and finally, I would like to acknowledge my mentor, my guru, Professor Marusio Brunori, who has been very supportive in all the situation, and Professor Travaglini, Dr. Stefano, and my colleague, Angela Morone. Thank you very much. Uh, please postpone your questions until the discussion section in 20 minutes. So Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Tapash Ghosh, increasing protein disorder with GC transition during vertebrate evolution. Okay. Uh, I'm really thankful to Professor Giorgio Bernardi for giving me an opportunity to um, share some of our recent results. Uh, these are the very small results. And I am also, uh, I'm also again thankful to Professor Bernardi to give me a chance to visit this romantic city. So today I'll talk on increasing protein disorder with GC transition during vertebrate evolution. Yesterday we have uh, listened, the, 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 the father of the isochrore professor from Giorgio Bernardi. So uh, I, I will not go in detail, but I will, I will show some of, our, some of uh, some the things uh, which I have taken from uh, Giorgio Bernardi's uh, paper in PNS. Uh, you know, in the, at the emergence of uh, um, cold-blooded vertebrates, uh, the G series isochore of the warm-blooded vertebrates, they have a, uh, in significant in increase in GC uh, content, uh, GC incre increment. But whereas uh, in the GC core region, the, this uh, does not uh, experience any, are not affected by the compositional transitions. And GC rich uh, genes, and these regions are mainly uh, com uh, affected by the 50% of the genome, and it is mainly made up of made up gene research genes and it is also composed of about 50% of the total genes. Uh, these regions are exemplified by the, uh, that Professor Bonadio already mentioned in his uh, lecture that it's a high, uh, it's, um, it's a high recombination and the transcription activity, it's open, it, it occurs in open chromatin structure, et cetera, et cetera. So recently uh, it is, uh, uh, it has been uh, discovered that the protein intrinsic disorder is one of the, imp I can skip these things. Okay, so these are the, uh, these are two theories uh, that I am not going to the debate. Uh, the selectionist theory is proposed by Professor Bernardi and, and neutralist theory, the, for adaptation at high body temperatures, this is the things they are arguing, that extra hydrogen bonds, they can pair strong hydrogen bonds and it will increase the stability of the stem structures of the micro, micro mRNA, ribosomal RNA, and not only this, this is the most important thing, the G-series isocodone papers, those amino acids that thermodynamically stabilize the proteins. So this is the um, so from view from the selectionist uh, group, and neutralist uh, theory is it, it simply reflects the variation in the process of mutation across the genome. Isocode structures of vertebrates genomes is the outcome of the difference in the pattern and the frequency of recombinations and also the biotin conversion, they also, uh, some people are arguing that fascinates the GC, uh, high GC in the recombination region. So today, uh, 
because most of the, recently it has been discovered that there are a huge number of proteins, they have the highly intrinsic disorder. The traditional view is that the protein folding into th particular three-dimensional structure is prerequisite for, a, for doing a particular, uh, for doing a function uh, in function. And it has been, uh, but it has been shown, it has been observed that many of the, these things are not following many of the amino acids. That is, they don't have any three-dimensional particular three-dimensional structure, fixed three-dimensional structure. And it has been also observed that the, if we increase the, if we increase the uh, uh, organism complexity, the percentage of GC um, intrinsic disorder is also increasing. So, so we are looking, so what uh, we, are, we are interested, whether is there any uh, relation with the increment of GC with the protein disorder content? So with this, uh, so we are very curious to, uh, to see the things what is happening with the increment of GC, uh, what is happening in case of uh, in protein disorder. So what we did, uh, this is the classical things, we classified, uh, we subdivided the, the total genes from, we have taken the human or genopause genes, and we classified this into three different subcategories, low GC, high GC, mid, medium, mid GC, and high GC. And there is no, uh, obviously there is, uh, there should, there is no GC content, significant um, GC content between the high and low GC between the human and uh, genopause. Whereas if you, if you increase, the, if you go to the higher end, uh, that is if you go to the uh, higher increase GC content, the number of uh, the GC content also increases. And we also measured the uh, intrinsic disorder, the average disorder length uh, in, the in the different subcategories of the, uh, this orthologous protein. And interestingly, we found there is no significant difference in disorder content in the low GC group, whereas if you go to the meat, there is some difference, and in the high GC, it is extremely significant. So this is the very interesting thing, because uh, we, we, we expect the opposite thing, uh, because, uh, and also, we uh, calculated the uh, correlation coefficient uh, for the increment of delta GC and the delta order, delta D, um, disorder. And this is the correlation value, and this is highly significant. So this is the delta GC means, the GC content between the difference of GC content between human and genopus, and delta disorder is the disorder content between human and genopus. So then the conflicts arises. Why? Because uh, if we increase the GC, it has been observed uh, with the increment of GC, the proteins with they have they are increasing their mo most of the um, there are large number of amino acids which is hydrophilic in nature they are substituted by hydrophobic amino acids. Whereas, in case of, uh, so, okay, so this is the things which, which was, which was, uh, which was shown by earlier by Barnard and Zub that uh, the, in the high GC region, the hydrophobicity value is increasing uh, in case of human, then the genopus. So this is, but the conflicts arises, uh, the, because since we are getting with the increment of GC, we are getting the disorder regions and the higher number of disorder regions, percentage of disorder region is increasing, and disorder, uh, intrinsic disorder regions, they lack hydrophobic amino acids, mostly. Mm -hmm. so, so is it, so this is the thing, so what we did, we calculated the hydrophobicity values in the ordered and disorder regions. And as expected, we, get, we got the, in the order region, the hydrophobicity value is increasing than the disorder regions. So, and the total hydrophobicity value of the total protein is mainly guided by the, in both the, from the order and the disorder regions. This is the regression analysis, and obviously the order regions, they are contributing a lot than the disorder region. And we also calculated the delta GC value in the order, genopass order to human order regions, and also calculated the human or genopass order to human disorder regions. And you see, there is a significant increment of delta GC in the region from order to disorder region, then order to order region. Then what we did, 
we sub -cal calculated the amino acid substitution frequency. Uh, in, uh, we cal classified the in, in, in four different groups. One is the hydrophilic to hydrophilic amino acids and hydrophobic to hydrophobic and hydrophobic to hydrophilic amino acids and hydrophilic to hydrophobic amino acids in the uh, in both the regions that is the from order region to disorder regions or from order region to the order region transitions. You see in the from order region as expected in the from in the order regions that is from order to order region the hydrophobic to hydrophobic transition is more than the hydrophobic to hydrophilic or something. And but in the disorder regions the hydrophobic amino acid is mainly substituted by the hydrophilic amino acids. That is the hydrophobic to hydrophilic it is more uh, it is higher in case of order to disorder region whereas in hydrophilic to hydrophobic it is greater in case of order regions. So then why this conflict arises? Because uh, it was, uh, we, we know that the, with the increment of GC, the hydrophobic value of the, most of the amino acids, hydrophilic amino acids are substituted by hydrophobic amino acids. So why, wh what we are getting, we got the higher increment of delta GC value in, in the, in the disorder, order to disorder regions, then the order to order regions. So all we, 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 we uh, analyzed the codon GCPR score in the in those regions that is from order to disorder region and this is the you have taken from this paper that here each codon family has been classified into gc4 gc middle and gc rich so this is the this is, let us suppose this is phenylalanine these are the two the, these two codons are com, uh, phenylalanine composed of these two codons so there is no other way since because ttc and ttt so they have classified this as a gc, GC Rich codon, and in the case of leucine, you see this is the CTC, CTC. These are the uh, at most two bases are uh, G or C, so they have classified this is the GC rich codon, and this is the GC middle, and this is the GC poor regions of so code codons. So we analyzed these things in the in those regions uh, that is uh, disorder promoting amino acids. We we, we calculated what is happening in case of uh, um, uh, codon frequency. So we we have seen that this is the all of the amino acids which are most frequent, prevalent in the disorder regions. So you see in the all the amino acids, they are using the GC rich codon. This is the pure GC rich codon. This is also the pure GC rich. These are codons are mainly using <coughs> by these amino acids in the disorder region. So. I, then we, uh, this is the bias gene conversion is one of the uh, uh, important things people are advocating. So we, sh we, ca uh, we expected that the GC increase for bias gene conversion must exhibit in the recombining region. So we calculated the, the percentage of recombination hotspot in the, both in the order and disorder region. So our expectation, if it is due to the B bias gene conversion, it should be uh, higher in the uh, disorder regions because the increment of GC is higher, uh, whatever you got in increment of GC is higher in the disorder region, or as it is lower in case of um, uh, order to order regions, order regions. So on the contrary, we got the recombination percentage of recombination hotspot is higher in case of order region than the disorder region. So I, I don't know whether it could be explained by biogen conversion or not, but, but we got this, this type of results. Now we proposed, this is the disorder increment of which GC is an advantageous selection because the disordered protein, uh, they, the, because the disordered protein, they, by increasing their disorder, they have increased their protein function, they are, uh, they are uh, multifunctional proteins. And the second thing, the, they are also connected with the high, these are the half proteins because the, by increasing the dis, um, uh, disorder content, they can interact with a large number of proteins. So this is the, and also we got uh, negative correlation, this is a huge significant negative correlation between the protein disorder and aggregation propensity of the uh, um, uh, proteins. So we propose that the, this is the, just by increasing the GC content, they, the total hydrophobicity of the uh, 
um, uh, protein is not only increasing, they are also increasing the disordered content. And the, by, their, by this thing, they are also inhibiting the aggregation, that is the uh, aggregation uh, pro, um, uh, propensity. So these are the things we got um, uh, in our results. And I think this is the last. Uh, this uh, Arup Panda and Shoumuita Poddar, they contributed in this work. And we are also finally thankful to the Department of Biotechnology Government India for the financial help. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and now the floor is open for questions to all speakers and to discussion. Um, could you explain how did you measure this recommendation hotspot uh, percentage? This, this yeah, HAP map, we, uh, we did it from the HAP map. Plot. Okay, but is it the, um, the distance yeah, to the I nearest hotspot? Is it the, do you measure the percentage of region occupied by a hotspot, or do you measure the number of hotspots in a particular region? How exactly do you do this? Please use the microphone because uh, people behind don't. What percentage is it is covering in the in the ordered and disordered regions? And yeah, I should mention that uh, 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 it covers only about 25 to 30 percent of the genes because we uh, there is a large number of genes which uh, we could not uh, uh, map in the hotspot region because they most probably those in those genes the hotspots. Uh, recombining hotspots regions are absent. But this is a, uh, it is a preliminary thing. I have a question for Daniel, actually. <laughs> uh, so in yeast, in Saccharomyces, there's an ancient paralogue of sub-35 called Ski7. And this protein is responsible for onsetting mRNA decay, non-stop decay when you get read-through into the poly-A tail. <coughs> um, so I have a couple of questions. First of all, whether uh, you think in the ribosome profiling experiments, SKI-7 may be masking some of your read-through uh, transcripts. And secondly, whether you think it may be the interplay between um, the effects of Cyplus and SKI-7 which cause these interesting diverse phenotypes. Yeah, so we don't have any data on um, SKI-7 yet. And we were very interested in changes in RNA levels um, for the reasons that you suggest. And there are a few. Um, they don't seem to be uh, responsible for the phenotypes uh, in those strains that we've looked at uh, when we've gone back. We've been able to recapitulate it just by looking at uh, art or read through um, that we create artificially by mutating the stop codon. Um, and it doesn't seem to be dependent on changes in levels. Um, but definitely that's a, a mechanism that could, could be operating. I actually had a, a question um, for Tapash. So in um, many organisms, intrinsic disorder is actually coupled um, with dosage toxicity. So um, proteins that went over expressed are, are toxic to the cell. Um, and have you looked at changes in gene expression between Xenopus and human um, and whether those uh, are changed? Uh, and does that correlate with disorder? Pardon? Uh, what I mean to say is that so if you look in um, flies or in worms or, or yeast as well, um, the genes that are toxic when overexpressed um, tend to encode disordered proteins. Um, and so you're seeing an increase in protein disorder, right, going from Xenopus um, to human. And I'm curious whether you've seen a change uh, in protein exp or gene expression to compensate uh, for this. You haven't looked, yeah, maybe you haven't looked. Uh, no. I, I would like to give the, pre I'm sorry, the priority, if there is a misunderstanding or miscommunication, I would like to have priority for deferred questions first. Sorry. Eugene. Yeah, I actually also have a question too. Uh, Daniel, that might connect to this last talk, however, a little bit. Mm, so you told us about this very provocative discovery of a um, number of new prions. So to educate us maybe a little bit more, could you tell us something about the features of these proteins? Both structural, because, and here's the connection, uh, many of the known prions, or, uh, not many, but the majority of the known prions have some very particular disordered region. So does that hold? 
in your new set. And then how, in terms of evolutionary conservation, what kind of profile do they show? Yes, yeah, so that's actually very interesting. So um, yeast are actually a little bit different um, than PRP, for example, um, just the mechanism by which they fold. So PRP um, yeah, has a very actually well-ordered monomeric structure, and then through a um, beta strand exchange mechanism actually forms fibers, whereas um, SOP35 exists in sort of a natively unfolded state and actually goes through an ensemble of oligomeric species. Some of those are on pathway to aggregation, some aren't. Um, and so, um, actually, it's not surprising then, right, that the sequences are rather different. So in SEP35 and many other well-known yeast prions, they have an asparagine bias and also a glutamine bias in that prion domain that I showed you. That's not true for PRP. Um, so in those um, uh, semi-denaturing agarose gels that I've showed, um, what I did was to run um, the, the protein from the strains that have these curable changes in phenotype um, and then extract protein, electroelute it, and look by mass spec to see what peptides are represented presented there, but not in the cured fraction. Um, and so I see several different cases. So it's some um, basically are, appear to be aggregates of uh, these other proteins within the yeast proteome that have these polyasparagine um, rich domains on them. But others actually um, don't have any asparagine or glutamine enrichment. Um, but instead, they appear to be, um, at least by some algorithms that David Eisenberg has um, put forth uh, of the class of PRP. So they can form um, these motifs called steric zippers. Um, that basically they're very tight uh, beta binding interfaces that would occlude water. Um, so there's still a lot to be done. Um, and I think the gold standard here really is to show in protein transformation experiments, right, that you can make those fibers in vitro and use them um, to transform the, the phenotype of the cell. Um, but I think it's clear that there are, um, at least those other types um, are, are conserved. Yeah, so for SEP35, um, you actually can see switching out to Canada albicans for a few hundred million years. Um, but the, in, in general, you know, it's interesting if you look at um, the complex formation, it's a little different. So sometimes you'll see um, that, you know, maybe a protein will lose uh, the prion domain as uh, you go far further out in evolution. But if you look at other members of the same protein complex, they may have acquired it, actually. Um, and, and so that's, that's very interesting. As far as the, um, the steric zippers, um, those seem to be maybe a little more conserved. That may be the mechanism that's used much more commonly uh, in, in higher organisms. Giorgio. Um, here. Just a comment on uh, what uh, Giri said. He mentioned at the end that you may have high sequence similarity and still different folds in the protein, if I understood correctly. Now, uh, it has been shown in the case of coat proteins of viruses that you may have exactly the opposite. In other words, you can have differences in sequence and the same folds. So you keep the structure of the, of the protein, which is another point in favor of near neutrality extended to the protein level. So it is, uh, apparently the two things are possible. So it's, it's important to stress how complex things become when you reach the, the protein level. Uh, Eugene, another question. Comment. So I was actually yeah. taking directly from where Georgia stopped um, and asked a question to Gary. Now, I think one of us gets our combinatorics somewhat wrong. It was on the, shown on the slide that for a peptide of 100... Microphone. Oh, yes. Uh, for a peptide uh, of 100 amino acids, there were 10 to the 20th possible variants. Now, if I get my combinatorics out, it is 20 to the power of 100, which is... Or, which is a very, very different type of number. Even allowing for the small fraction of the sequence universe uh, being conducive to stable structure formation, it is still an incredible huge number. Therefore, I strongly suspect that while 
What, what Giorgio pointed out is absolutely true and fully compatible with all the data on the stability, on the robustness of the folding nucleus shown here, that uh, proteins with the same fold can have dramatically different sequences, with vanishing sequences, sequence similarity. The opposite, what was the conjecture posed on the conclusion slide, may not necessarily be correct. That is given the vastness of the sequence universe convergence of different folds to highly similar sequences is extremely unlikely and the reality of it is so far that I am unaware of such examples in naturally evolving proteins. While it can be done and has been done artificially um, with directed evolution. And more questions, comments? Well, uh, I believe, oh yeah, please, uh, behind. I'll give it to you. Actually, I guess it was not the directed evolution. It was all about the neutral evolution, neutrality. Neutrality, neutrality. Neutrality, yes. Yeah, I guess my noise was, it was neutrality. Microphone, please. Neutrality is very easy. Can you please use microphone? Actually, it's disturbing. Uh, actually, the neutral selection, what will happen that uh, if there's neutral selection, then all the combinations neutral will occur. Selection yeah, 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 you're right, that neutral selection uh, doesn't happen very routinely, but uh, we are always actually, we are just over ambitious about the directed evolution. That's why we don't talk about neutral evolution. And neutral evolution is the most basic way of evolution. Yeah, it's the most basic way. And if you, what I saw in that, there are 10 to the power 20 combinations of uh, 100, M uh, peptide, 100 amino acid peptide. Means uh, so much different proteins can be formed by just 20 amino acids. So such a tremendous situation can be handled when the genomic era will come. This is genomic time. It's just 20 years of the sequencing and, uh, no, not sequencing, like, uh, means all the genomics uh, technology which we got, all the genome projects, all the genome sequences, these are just the 20 to 30 years old. So just imagine that what will happen after 100 years. After 100 years when most of the amino, most of the organisms will be sequenced, there will be plenty of sequences, plenty of genomes, and plenty of databases, and plenty of technology more. So then it will be more easy to see the things clearly because at this moment we are we have just started the genome the genome biology All right, let's solve yeah. This biology. yeah i guess it's enough thank you uh, all right are we do we have any other questions i guess everybody's hungry so let's have a round of applause for all the speakers thank you very much <laughs>